So today I want to talk about the Miller effect. I've been um, on a rant for the past couple of years now on MOSFETs and amplifiers because uh, they've been challenging to me and I've been pulling my hair out and all kinds of stuff. So I've done quite a bit of research and uh, into MOSFET amplifiers and amplifiers in general. And uh, there's this thing called Miller effect, which uh, impacts a lot of uh, amplifiers we use. So before I start, I just want to show this video here. Well, I could go on for hours, but I'd probably start to bore you. You know, I really couldn't blame Elaine. I wanted a career. And they built those roads that were fond of drainage in mine. So we had to take a special Jeep up to the main road. In fact, we were lucky to even get a Jeep since just the day before. Only one we had broke down. Bad accident. Did you guys see that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Okay, so so what I want to cover off today, I'm going to talk a little bit about MOSFET construction, some observations, what happens with MOSFETs, and stuff which I've talked about before. I'm just going to regurgitate some of the stuff I've been talking about before. Uh, but the only thing new is I'm going to get into a little bit of what the Miller effect is, uh, the past Miller capacitance theorem, and uh, some calculations uh, to demonstrate what it is and back that up with LT spice simulations. So that's what I want to cover off today. And then in the next uh, presentation, there's going to be a part two. I'll be talking about how to address the Miller effect because there's a ways, uh, done a lot of uh, research and some simulations in terms of what you can do to neutralize uh, the Miller effect in amplifiers. And then subsequent, there's going to be a fourth uh, presentation which on feedback amplifiers and how they actually work because I've found that not a lot of people understand, or maybe they understand it, but there's a lack of documentation of what a feedback amplifier, how it actually works, what it's doing, how does it impact gain? How does it impact, you know, input, output impedance? So I'll be talking about that in a subsequent talk. So as, uh, as always with all my talks, you know, I'm no expert in this. I just, I like to talk. Uh, give me a mic and a soapbox and I'll talk for hours. So it's just what I, what I've surmised going through and reading texts and looking at equations and doing all kinds of stuff. So just be aware I'm no expert and take what I say with a grain of salt. Okay, and uh, here's some places where I got information for this talk to put this together. And when I learned about, uh, you know, Miller Effect and uh, amplifiers, uh, our good friend, uh, W2AEW, he's got a really good video on uh, Cascode amplifiers and the Miller Effect. There's um, um, Dr. K. Uh, he's a professor. At, I can't remember what university, but he's got some good... Uh, content and uh, Professor Fiora, uh, he's also got some good stuff, uh, more so around derivation of the uh, Miller effect. And uh, in the past on Matteo Aboy's uh, channel, I've re referred to this woman as uh, Matteo Aboy's grad student, and she's not, she's actually a full professor. Her name's actually Dr. Christina Crespo. So she's a full professor and she teaches advanced, um, she, a second year um, elect, electronics engineering at, I guess, a university somewhere in Spain. So uh, her videos are phenomenal, very good. So this, you know, I guess for everyone here, this is more so for entertainment because what I'm gonna be showing you is not something as an amateur radio operator, you're going to be using day to day. Um, so it may be a little bit painful for you to watch, but it's not something you do because typically the majority of us take a circuit, build it, solder it together. We have a kit, build it together. And all the background analysis and all the stuff is done for us in the background. So, you know, this is more of a, um, I guess, like an entertainment, bit of an entertainment for you. 
but I try to document things more so. So if you, in the future, you need to understand this, you could come back to this video, you, you look at it and it may make uh, sense, more sense to you. So next couple of slides is from my uh, presentation I did on down the rabbit hole. It just talks about a MOSFET construction. And I think uh, you guys could see this video, right? Basically, a MOSFET is you've got this uh, substrate and you put a layer of oxide and a metal uh, conductor top of it and you dope two areas, the uh, um, drain and the source. And if you just take a look at this, you know, you've got a metal layer, an oxide, which, which is a insulator. Then you've got this P substrate. So that's basically a capacitor, right? And so what happens if you apply a voltage across this drain and source, you've got a, a layer of positive charge ions here. Look, they're, typically people call them holes. As you apply a, a positive voltage here, you attract electrons here and you push away the holes. And what starts to happen as you increase the voltage, you start to create a channel. And this channel starts to form. And eventually, once the voltage is strong enough and a channel is formed right away, right across, you have electrons flowing. And the MOSFET is now turned on. And electrons are starting to flow. So that's basically all a MOSFET is. So if you take a look at this, you know, you've got, it just riddled with capacitors. You've got this layer and this layer and insulation between that forms a capacitor. you got a capacitor here, here. There, it just riddled. If you take a look at this and you break it down, you can see there are all kinds of capacitors here. A MOSFET is just one big giant capacitor. Same thing with a, um, uh, a, a BG, B, BJT transistor. And you could take all these capacitors. These are all intrinsic. They are all inside the MOSFET. Uh, uh, they're all built in. There's nothing you could do about it. It's got these MOSFETs inside. So if you take your MOSFET, it's as if there these capacitors are added. There's a capacitor that goes from the gate to the drain. This is inside the MOSFET. Then there's a capacitor, capacitor between the gate and the source and a capacitor between the drain and the source. And all that arises from all these capacitors here. So one of the things I did um, was I said, you know what, with all these capacitors, let me just try and model this in L LT Spice. And let me see if I could get the same behavior as a MOSFET gets. And so I built this little model here as a, as a whim using the parameters here. And I'll show, I've got another slide Subsequent slide, I show how these uh, parameters here, uh, this is from the data sheet of the IRF 510, and how those translates to these capacitors, to, to CGD, CGS, because it's not CGS. Here it's CISS, COSS, CRSS. Then you've got some other lead uh, uh, values here, which I, I put into the model. And if you look at uh, this video here by uh, uh, Christina Crespo, um, she gives the equations for how this, and you've, you'll find this in a lot of other places. I'm just quoting her uh, as a source, but uh, you could solve these. Uh, um, you could solve these and figure out what uh, CGD, CDS, and CGS is just from some simple manipulation here. And I actually did it. You could see the little calculations here that I did. So then what I did, I took a, a IRF 510, I took my model and I looked at the voltage here coming in or the impedance. I think I looked at the impedance uh, coming in, seen from uh, this point here and seen from this point here. And I compared the two. So here is for the, uh, the actual IRF 510. This is the, uh, the impedance uh, coming in, looking into the IR 510. And this is my model here. 
And if you look at it, the impedance looking in at low frequencies, there's a little bit of a difference between it. And it's about like 30 ohms or so uh, difference, but down at higher frequencies, they're bang on. They're, they completely match. So up until this point, you know, what I saw was, hey, this MOSFET tends to short out at high frequencies. It's got something to do with these capacitors in, inside of them, and they're causing, you know, the input impedance to be very small at uh, high, high frequencies. And this is where this guy, John Miller, comes in, uh, and the Miller effect comes in. Now, as I go forward and I talk, you'll, you'll periodically see me referring to an AC model. And this is very common in transistor analysis. You know, if you have a complex waveform, you know, sometimes it's easy to break, easier to break it down into an AC component and the DC component. If you add these two together, you get the complex waveform. So, so that way it might be easier to deal with the DC component and deal with the AC, AC component. With, with amplifiers, it's the same thing. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of videos. If you just go on YouTube and you search for AC small signal model for a transistor, you'll get a ton of videos of people showing you how this all works. I'm not going to go into this in de detail, but you'll see me talking about the AC small signal model. And just basically the DC model, it's all about the cap. So the DC models, you know, these high value uh, capacitors are DC blockers. So you remove anything downstream and upstream of this cap and the circuit you're left with, you do a DC, DC analysis. With the AC analysis, you short all caps because the AC sees this cap as a short circuit. You short all voltage sources to ground and you do your analysis. So for example, here's RB, uh, it's connected to a voltage source, it's grounded. And uh, same thing with RD and same thing with RL, they're all grounded. And the MOSFET, you replace it with a current source. And it's a current source that uh, the current is uh, driven by this parameter transconductance value and uh, the voltage delivered to the gate drives the current here. So if we take our um, model of a MOSFET with all these intrinsic uh, capacitors and we look at the AC model of this, which is a current that is driven by the gate voltage. So once the gate voltage goes past the threshold voltage, a current starts to flow. If the gate voltage is below the threshold voltage, there's no current, there's a little bit of leakage current, but for intensive purposes, there's no current flowing. So um, this uh, equation here, I talk a little bit about it in my uh, talk I did on the, um, transistor tracer. And I show in the transistor tracer how it calculates GM and calculates all these other parameters. So if you want a little bit more information on that, go back to my uh, transistor tracer video. But so anyway, so if the gate voltage here is zero, there's no voltage here. Well, then the voltage of this capacitor, and again, these capacitors are inside the MOSFET, they're intrinsic capacitors. So if there's zero voltage here, there's zero voltage here, there's, this is grounded. So the voltage across this capacitor is zero. However, if this voltage here is zero, there's no current flowing here. And from the DC, the source, your source, your, your, your supply to across this resistor, since there's no current, the current, uh, the voltage is the same. So VDS is VDC. And this capacitor is now charged to VDC. Whatever, if this is 12 volts or 13 volts, this capacitor is charged to 13 volts. So now as you increase the voltage here and you get past the threshold voltage, well, this current starts, oops, current starts to flow through this, uh, uh, this um, uh, um, 
MOSFET, current starts to flow. And as current starts to flow here, there's a voltage drop. So VDS now decreases. Now, as VDS decreases, this, char this capacitor now discharges because it's got a lower voltage. So the, this capacitor now starts to discharge. And as IDS in, increases, and this, this voltage here gets lower and lower, and eventually it'll get to zero or close to zero, this capacitor now is completely discharged. And what happens now, as you increase the gate voltage, this, char this capacitor starts to charge now relative to gate. So what, what we're seeing here is this capacitor charges as, as the uh, gate voltage comes, uh, comes on initially when there's um, below the threshold voltage, all current flows into this capacitor, it starts to charge. Then once a current starts flowing across here and this voltage starts to drop, this capacitor starts to discharge. And once it gets to zero or close to zero, this capacitor now starts to charge relative to, to the gate. So all this charging and discharging causes the MOSFET a delay in terms of how quickly the MOSFET can turn on. And this is critical for when a MOSFET's acting as a switch, for example, in a buck converter or a buck boost con converter. And if you look at the IRF 510, you can see here's our what I was uh, talking about, the capacitance of the, the MOSFET. But here, it gives you the charges to charge these capacitors. So here's the charge to charge the gate, the source uh, capacitor. It takes 2.3 nanocoulombs to charge it. And the gate, uh, the, uh, gate to drain takes 3.8. And the total charge, now there are other capacitors uh, in there. So obviously these two numbers don't add up to that. But the total charge needed to turn this uh, MOSFET on is 8.3 nanocoulombs. Now keep in mind, one coulomb moving in one second is one amp. This is 8.3 nanocoulombs. It's a tiny amount of charge that's flowing. So one interesting thing is uh, you kinda, this kind of caught me a little bit by surprise. If you look at your scope probes, this is what my scope probe uh, appears to be inside the scope. So it's one mega ohm in parallel with 18 picofarads. So once you connect this to your circuit, potentially it's one mega ohm, which is really high impedance, should, but it's 18 picofarads. So if you've got 15 picofarads between your gate to drain um, uh, capacitor, you're adding a potentially 18 picofarads. So you're potentially doubling this. So depending where you put these probes, you could have a dire effect on that MOSFET, how that MOSFET turns on. So it's something to be aware of, is that uh, your probes could impact the MOSFET behavior. So this is a little bit of an egghead um, uh, chart. Um, it shows a lot of things, a little bit confusing, but uh, basically showing several things. It's this line here showing the gate voltage as a function of time. This orange line here is showing the current that's flowing through the MOSFET as a function of time. And the purple uh, line here is showing the, the voltage here at the drain as a function of, of, of time. And, hey. and they've also put, yeah. yeah. Did you want to take questions uh, as we go along? end at the end at the end okay yeah okay so um yeah because this 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 is gonna be long enough if i pause with questions we're gonna go for over an hour and a half yeah okay so, no um, so as you now as you uh, turn on the moss that you apply a voltage to the gate okay remember i said the the, the this capacitor starts to charge your uh, gate to drain capacitors charged a relative to uh, uh, your source supply voltage. So uh, during this portion, as you slowly increase the gate voltage, you're charging CGS, you're charging this capacitor. Once you hit the threshold voltage, 
at which point the current starts flowing down here. You'll see current here now increasing. The MOSFET now is turning on and there's current flowing down here and VD is starting to come down. V, VD is, is, uh, is dropping because there's a current across this resistor and there's a voltage drop. Now, the interesting thing is once you get to a certain point, okay, the gate voltage is basically, it's locked in, it's, uh, it's held constant. And that's from this capacitor discharging. And that's called the Miller Plateau. And once that capacitor is discharged, then it's, it begins to recharge again and both capacitors continue to charge. And that's this point here. So right at the end of the Miller Plateau, that's when you've reached the maximum current coming through here. You've, uh, you, you've hit the maximum and your gate, your drain voltage is at the lowest point. You see right at that point there. So right at that point, your uh, uh, CGD and CGS is almost uh, fully charged. Okay. Now, if we take a if we take a two N seven thousand and we simulate this in LT Spice and we put a really fast pulse across the MOSFET here and we take a look at what's happening, this is over like seven nanoseconds. So you can see right here. Here's the CGS charging. Here's the Miller Plateau, right? And here's the uh, the uh, the capacitor is continuing to charge, and right at that point, the MOSFET's turned on. So it takes, you know, like of, of, of the order, about four or five nanoseconds for that capacitor to turn on, which is a long time. So in summary, so far, what we found is that I, I talked about, you know, I, I observed that these MOSFETs tend to short out at high frequencies. Uh, the impedance tends to go down. It's got something to do with the capacitors. I've now showed that the time for the MOSFET to turn on is dependent on the, these capacitors charging, this CGS and CGD uh, charging. And in some data sheets, they actually give you how much current is needed, how much charge is needed for those capacitors to charge. So let's start talking about the Miller effect capacitance and theorem. I found this to be very confusing because a lot of people use these terms uh, interchangeable. Um, you, and you, anytime you, you, know, you Google Miller, you'll find them using these terms interchangeable and it's very, very con confusing. To me, what the Miller effect is, it's what's happening, it's the effect of the capacitors have on the overall uh, transistor. And here, you know, they talk about it's forming a low pass filter on that signal coming in because of the uh, uh, capacitors, those intrinsic uh, capacitors. The Miller capacitance and theorem is telling you how to mathematically deal with that capacitance and how to figure out what the bandwidth of that transistor or that MOSFET is going to be. So the Miller theorem, this is what the Miller theorem basically says. If you have any inverting amplifier, it's got a gain of say minus A, it's an inverting amp, so it's got a negative gain, right? If you have a capacitor across the input to the output, it's the same for from a mathematical perspective for analyzing you know, the bandwidth, it's the same as taking that capacitor and putting it across the input to ground and across the output to ground and increasing the value by A. So for example, if this gain was say minus nine and this capacity was one picofarad, so the equivalent Miller capacitor you're gonna put here is one times nine plus one, 10. So 10 times one is 10. So one microfarad equals 10 microfarads across here. So you get a multiplication based on gain. The gain is the absolute value. So even though it's negative here, 
you're using the absolute value of it. You're not plugging in minus nine in here or minus eight. You're taking the absolute value. And the same thing happens with, with just about any impedance. For example, you put a resistor across the input to the output. It's the same thing. You put the resistor to ground on either side. However, with, with an impedance, not a capacitor, the uh, value of that impedance decreases by the gain. Okay. So again, if you've got a 100 ohm resistor here, you've got a 9, a gain of minus 9. So you've got 100 divided by 9 plus 1 is 10. So you've got a 10 ohm resistor here. So you'll have a 100 ohm resistor here. This will be a 10 ohm resistor here. And same thing at uh, the outputs. In the case of, of the capacitor, the output gets increased slightly. A plus 1 over A is pretty much A. So it, it increases slightly. So if this is 1, it may be 1.1 picofarads. Same thing with the uh, um, uh, impedance here. It decreases by a value of A over A plus 1, which is basically A. So if this is, say, 100 ohms, this might be 98 ohms or 99 ohms, something like that. So reason I showed you that is if you look at the MOSFET here, and you look at a transistor, again, these are the intrinsic capacitors. For a common source amplifier, this is your input, this is your output, that capacitor is going from your input to your output, and it has to be millerized. That's why the bandwidth drops so fast, is because this capacitor gets multiplied by the gain and it gets shorted to ground. Same thing with the transistor. This capacitor with a common emitter amplifier where the output is at the, um, what's this, the collector? That's the emitter, right? So the collector is the output and the base is your input. The capacitor is going from the input to the output of your amplifier. That capacitor needs to be millerized. So, okay, let's do some calculations here. Let's put this into action and let's see what actually happens. So. Let's take a 3904 and let's just, this is a common emitter amplifier. So, and let's just model it in LT Spice and let's use a low frequency um, sweep so that the Miller capacitance is not uh, a factor here. The frequency is too low for the Miller capacitance uh, to be a, uh, an issue. So if we model this and we take a standard model you get from AC analysis, and I've showed what the model predicts here. It predicts based on all these values, a gain of 5.2 and an input impedance seen at V in here of uh, 5.8K. And if you look at from LT Spice, we get 5.1. It's basically the same. We get 5.1 um, gain and we've got uh, 5.78. It's pretty close. You get, so this model, this AC model analysis is pretty good. So the way I arrived at that, the first thing you do is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this because uh, this is where I'll bore you guys and put you guys to sleep. But basically, the first thing you do, you ground all DC sources because we're doing a DC analysis. So this gets grounded. So this resistor gets grounded. This resistor gets grounded. And... Uh, then for a BJT, we have to work out what the resistance here, there's an internal equivalent resistance called little re. Uh, you could see my calculation for little re here. And then you've got big re here. This is a re coming across here. And so uh, you have to work out what rn is. So that's what's seen from here what the impedance seen from here looking into this transistor is. And that's beta times this little RE plus this big RE. And you figure out what that is. And it's uh, so beta times 4.91 times 200 
and all these resistors are in parallel. You do a parallel, you know, calculation of that comes out 5817, exactly 5817. So that's where that comes in. It's documented here in case you need to do this in the future. So now let's, let's add a feedback resistor here and let's see the impact. So let's add a 5K resistor here. I put a 10 micro uh, farad capacitor here. It's basically a DC blocker because I didn't want this um, to impact the bias of this uh, transistor. So this has no impact. And plus it's such a low frequency here. This is gonna be like zero. It's gonna have no impact whatsoever. So if we take a look at this now, and the model predicts our gain is going to be 4.3. And if I go into LT Spice, I get 3.9, which is pretty close. And uh, the Zn seen in here is 811 ohms. I'm getting uh, LT Spice predicts 837 ohms, which, again, is pretty close for a AC model. So it looks as if um, it's not bad. And this calculation is based on Miller. I've taken this resistor and I've millerized it and I've included. So what, what does that mean, millerized it? Well, here's the previous calculation I did with the two bias resistors here and the R, beta times RE plus big RE. And here's the millerized 5K resistor. So you take 5K, one plus the gain. Now the gain you use is the gain that we, that had no feedback. So you uh, millerize that. And again, these are all parallel resistors. You do the parallel combination, you get 811 ohms. And that's what uh, how I arrive at that calculation there. So what about capacitance? Let's look at capacitance here now. So <coughs> again, we've got this capacitor from gate to drain, which is going from input to output. And all that charging and dis discharging, that's causing you know wonky things to happen in the uh, MOSFET, and it's basically forming a low-pass filter. And Miller said to take that capacitor and short it to the input and output, and that's going to impact your bandwidth. So if I use now, I switch to an IRF 510 here, and I take a look at the 510. And I say, okay, let me do a sweep now from one meg to 100 megs. And let me take a look at what the uh, 3dB point should be, the 3dB cutoff. So based on the calculation of the IRF 510 data sheet, it should be 20 megahertz. But LT Spice, it says it's 1.7 megahertz, and that's the 3dB point. So it's like what the heck is going on it's like what have i done wrong here like geez and this is what's been i've been plagued with this forever ever since i started looking at these mosfets it's like i run run into a brick wall and it's like what the heck's going on and it took me a long time to figure this out and just one day i thought okay what what is the actual capacitance that the LT Spice is using. Is it using the datasheet MOSFET or is it using some something else? So that caused me to go down a rabbit hole. And so if you look at the data sheet, the data sheet is saying these are the, the capacitance. And based on that and that formula of got, you know, CGD should be 15 peaks uh, puffs and uh, CGS should, should be 165 picofarads. Now, uh, are you guys still with with me? You could still hear me, right? Yeah, no problem, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So one of the things I discovered in LT Spice, as I was trying to figure out what capacitance LT Spice is using, if you do the op analysis, the operating point analysis, and you go to the log file, it tells you <laughs> what what capacitance it uses. There's the CGS and CGD it uses. So if you look, it's using 100 picofarads for CGS. And in the MOSFET, I was using 165. But CGD, which is the more important one, 
I was using 15 puffs. It and LT spikes, it's using 117 picoferrets, not 15. So here's the problem. And the other thing is, it's giving you the transconductance here. It's telling you the threshold voltage. It's giving you all that stuff right here from the op analysis. And again, you have to go into the error log. If you go into LT Spice, you go into the error log, you get this inf information. So if you take a look at the MOSFET for the um, uh, IRF 510, you'll see it doesn't come out and say CISS, CR, or, uh, CR COSS or CGD, CGS. It's got CGD max, CGD min. So it's got a min and a max. So LT Spice in the background is doing some kind of wonky calculation to figure out what that is. Okay, and it turns out that it's doing a whole bunch of trigonometric functions in the background. I found a paper that talks about it and it's, 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 like what a rabbit hole it's like it just boggles my mind so so you, you got to ask yourself are these lt spice models are they really trustworthy can we use them and here's a case where it's not so i went forward and i said okay let me use the lt spice values and so i just did a mock-up of it i did the here's the miller uh, capacitance the CG, CGD capacitance that's been millerized. Here's the CGS capacitor, it's 100 picofarads. This is 117 picofarads multiplied by the gain plus one. And if you, you know, model this and you look at the output here and you look at the 3dB point of it, the 3dB point, you see it comes out 2.01 megahertz, 2.04 megahertz. So pretty close. So, you know, uh, this model definitely matches what I have, my simplified AC model here. So if I use the actual IRF 510 and I do my calculations and I look at the 3dB point, the uh, LT Spice is saying it's supposed to be 1.7 megahertz. I'm getting 2.0 megahertz. So it's off by about 300 kilohertz, which that's not bad for a you know a quick and dirty calculation you're saying you're roughly the cutoff of this amplifier is going to be around two megahertz that's the minus three db point and that's that's valuable to know and here's the math of uh, how i did this again for your reference basically you take uh you short out the dc sources you short out the all the DC blocking capacitors. Uh, if it's a MOSFET, you remove the MOSFET. In the case of a uh, BJT, you have to calculate that little RE and big RE and beta. It, for an AC model, you remove the IRF 510 because from an input perspective, this has got a very high input impedance, the MOSFET here. So you remove that MOSFET and you just plug in your your capacitors your millerized capacitors and your um, bias capacitors your source capacitors and you do your uh, calculation you know one over uh, two pi r in the r the total r and the miller the total miller capacitance uh, and you come up with frequencies there. So you get, you and you do the same thing for the input and the output. You have to look at both the input and output and the lower is gonna be your frequency, your 3 dB point. So here's the input, it's 2.047 and the output is 2.8 megahertz. So use a 2.047, here's a 2.047, that's what I used. Okay, so this is for reference. I'm not going to go through this because I, I bore you guys to tears uh, going through the calculations here, but it's here in case you ever have to go and do this. Now, this is something you kind of have to wrap your head around. It dawned on me that if you look at this MOSFET, okay, the gain of the MOSFET has not changed. The gain of the MOSFET remains the same. Okay, what's happening is because of you've got this millerized capacitor here, you've got a voltage divider. 
So whatever voltage you're feeding in here, okay, if there was no Miller capacitance here, low frequency, no Miller capacitance, then you get a gain of say 66, or you get a gain of 30 d dB, right? But that's from, you know, from here to there, this voltage compared to that voltage, right? Now, now, if you put the capacitor here, you've got a voltage divider. All this stuff here is, you know, an impedance that's feeding this impedance here. It's a voltage divider. I don't know if you guys could see that. So the voltage at the gate is dropped because of this, but it still gets amplified the same amount. So the net effect is the amplification from here to here drops. But the amplification from here to here is the same. I don't know if you guys could wrap your head around that. You, you could see that. But this is just because it's because of the AC source we're using here. It's feeding in at this point. So we're measuring the gain relative from here to there, not from here to there. OK, so uh, let's do another calculation of this. Let's look at the 2N7000. So here's my simplified AC model, you know, and I do a calculation. Same thing, I use the LT spice model. I go to the operating parameters and I get the uh, the actual values that L LT spice says it's using. And, you know, based on my little simple model, they match, they come out pretty good. It looks good for the minus uh, 3 dB point. So if I use the actual 2N7000, and again, I follow it. I'm off a little bit, again, about 300 kilohertz. Uh, it should be 6. The minus 3 dB point should be uh, 6 megahertz. I've um, got about 5.7, so close enough. So um, that's pretty good. And here's the high side. So if you look at the high side, the output side, the 3 dB point for the output is 9 uh, megahertz. So you pick the lower one, which is 5.7. So um that's it uh, this i think this is my uh, uh one of my last slides so the universe makes more sense to me now i don't know if it makes more sense to you but we started out the observation that you know hey these capacitors they basically short out the ground it's got something to do with this capacitor inside of it at high frequencies the input impedance is like a short cir circuit then we found you know these these intrinsic capacitors, CGS and CGGD, they charge and discharge and they call they cause some wonky things. And so this guy Miller said, okay, look, these those capacitors form a low pass filter at higher frequencies. And so if you take an impedance such as a resistor and you put it across the input and output of an inverting amplifier, this only applies to an inverting amplifier. So uh, if you put a, uh, some sort of feedback impedance, like a resistor between the input and output, the effect is that uh, uh, resistor gets reduced by the gain. So the higher you gain, the worse the effect. So if you've got a really high gain RF amplifier, you're going to get nailed by, by, by Miller. Same thing for capacitors. That intrinsic capacitor that's going from input to output, again, for only applies to an inverting amplifier, okay? The capacitance gets increased. What happens when a capacitor increases? It becomes more of a short. So, and it gets increased by the gain. So for a higher gain, high gain RF amplifiers, just the intrinsic capacitors, they short out. They cause this uh, low pass filter behavior. They basically short out. And here's why. It's because of the, the Miller effect. So in summary, high gain RF amplifiers are going to be problematic, period. And it's because the impedance will decrease. The input will always be shorted at higher frequencies. And that's due to the internal uh, capacitance uh, across the uh, uh, terminals. They get increased by the gain. So your 3 dB bandwidth decreases, and there's no doubt about it, you know, especially a high gain RF amp, it's going to be problematic. The, the, the takeaway from this for me is LT SPICE models. 
trust but verify, especially the non-native uh, models you get, do not trust them. You, they may be telling you one thing and you got to really look at it because if you get a wonky result, don't think that LT Spice is right. That model you have could be wrong. So that concludes this um, talk. So the next talk, I'm going to talk about how we address the Miller effect. And in a subsequent talk, I am going to also talk about feedback aims, how negative feedback actually works. And I developed the equations and the models of how that uh, feedback works. And there's a bunch of um, uh, ways that you can analyze this because I haven't seen too many people put forward an analysis of how an actual feedback amplifier works. And I found that to be quite frustrating and um, uh, and I scratched my head. So I did a fair amount of work on how um, uh, feedback amplifiers work. So that's going to be in an upcoming talk. So at that point, I will say this presentation is finished. And I'll open it up to questions. <clears throat>